Hello, Davey here, and welcome to my review of the Silverstone Precision PS15. Now, first things first, disclaimer, I was sent this case from Silverstone completely for free. This is a review sample. I have not paid a penny for it, and that is the end of my disclaimer. Uh, yes, this is a 3,000 subscriber channel that was sent something for free just for review from a company. I am just as shocked as you are. So, I have a job to do, so if you want to head to the video description and skip to any particular part of the video you fancy, please feel free to do that now or any time through the video if you don't want to see the bit you're seeing right now. You can have a like, triple tap and stuff on the screen, but you can also check the video description out or the first timestamp for you mobile users. Uh, and if while you're down there, you want to get this case and you're thinking of buying it from Amazon, there are Amazon affiliate links for various regions around the world. Uh, and if you want to pick it up through there, it will give a small kickback to this channel and it will help it out in various different ways. Ways. So I appreciate if you go and check those out. Uh, but apart from that, um, I think that's pretty much it. Apart from, you can pick this case up for a fairly decent price actually, about £50 or so. And that's great for ventilation purposes, full front vent and a tempered glass side panel. But if you want to check out how it performs with regards to that front vent, there are th is thermal testing uh, towards the end of the video. So thanks guys, I'll catch you in a second for the unboxing and I'll see you then. So what does the PS15 have to offer? Well, first we'll just deal with rounds 1, 2 and 3 of very standard but competent packaging to get down to the Precision PS15. An external overview wouldn't go amiss, so right up front, at the base we have the Silverstone logo which has a blue LED backlight and above is a mostly top to base fully filtered grille. You can see there's a bezel and fairly open supporting frame to the inner face adding rigidity to the front which will reduce the free area, so it's your basic trade between structural rigidity and thermal performance. A rather major feature of the PS15 is this tempered glass side panel window, which has a 20mm blackout strip applied to the inside perimeter. It's held in place by thumb screws, but the panel, at least in my case, isn't fully pressed up against the case, so it would have been nice to see some foam strips applied to the inside perimeter of the opening to take up the slack. Up top, back to the front panel, we find the front I.O., which consists of a drive activity LED, two USB 3.0 ports, separate headphone and microphone jacks, and the power button right at the end, which also contains a blue power LED backlight. Also up top is a feature that's become extremely popular and is implemented in a number of different ways from case to case. I'm of course referring to the magnetically applied top filter. This is more to prevent dust from settling in your system when the system is off rather than a filter for a top intake which we'll be testing later for full clarity. Underneath the filter is mounting options for two 120mm fans or a single 140mm fan. There's no radiator support up here since it's too close to the motherboard. Something I found noticeable but by no means a deal breaker was the pronounced ridge created by the top of the side panel against the top of the case. It's enough to stop a small slowly rolling reel of tape or in other words it's about 0.83mm or 33 thou. I can't imagine this was part of the design since the ridge to the back is about 0.5mm or 19 thou so this has to be the result of manufacturing tolerance. Moving on, the offside side panel is just painted steel without any detail which suits the clean theme of the case. The rear of the case reveals the very typical upper motherboard and 120mm fan position which has notched screw slots to make positioning during installation easier. Just below are the PCI Express slot covers which have an interesting screw cover plate but they are snap off panels without replacements in the accessories bag. Sure, it's a cheap case, but throwing in a couple of replacement panels wouldn't have cost an awful lot, and they're nice to have when your build evolves further down the line. And of course, at the base, we have the ATX power supply unit position. Just before we open the PS15 up, it's worth taking a gander at the underside. The front presents the front panel removal handle, and the rear holds the power supply unit intake filter if you go for a fan side down power supply unit installation. But it's a pretty flimsy filter in comparison to the top filter. Perhaps a small magnetic filter can be created for future cases to bring up the quality a little. And while we're here, the feet are just solid plastic, which isn't a shock for a budget case, but I'd recommend getting some hard foam or felt pads for those of you who like tinkering with your systems a lot. 
Now with the external overview out of the way, let's strip the case down to the chassis and check out what's on offer. The steel side panel can be removed after the removal of a couple of thumb screws. This panel is well reinforced with a perimeter of upstands that form the guides and retention mechanism. As for the front panel, the handle formed in the base of the front panel just needs a firm tug or two, but some care does need to be taken to prevent the power wires from being ripped out of the lower LED backlight. There's also a whole host of cables trailing from the front I.O. up top. As mentioned earlier, the tempered glass side panel window is held in place by four thumb screws, and by removing all of them and seeing whether the panel immediately drops off, we can tell if the design team was awake when they were finishing off this element. And it turns out they were. I then removed the panel with a little skepticism, fearing it was going to catch and then hit the deck, but no, someone was using their brain when they were designing this thing. Now, I know I sound like an ass, but a side panel that has a 50-50 chance of hitting the deck when you take it off just grinds my gears. But the question that comes to mind is, why did it come off so smoothly and stay in place without the screws? Well, it's all about the shape of the grommets over the nuts in the chassis. It's tapered, which encourages the glass to slide towards the case even if there aren't thumb screws present pressing against the glass. It's simple, but it works so well. As for the accessories bag, which you can find lashed to the inside of the case, we have some standoffs with motherboard screws, some power supply unit screws, three sets of 2.5 inch drive screws with grommets, an additional set of standard 2.5 inch drive screws, and a set of 3.5 inch drive screws, as well as a pile of zip ties. But there's no manual that comes with the case, which is a bit weird. You just get some sort of warranty sheet, and all of which was inside a couple of resealable bags. Back to the chassis, the front can take a couple of 120mm or 140mm fans and up to a 240mm radiator, but the front is as flat as a pancake which triggers the memory of a fan blade snapping clean off in a similarly designed chassis front in the past. I'll be discussing this more later, but account for a small set of rubber washers in the build budget with this case. Inside the case to the rear is everything we saw earlier, but here's a closer look at the stock 120mm fan which has a 3-pin connector. I believe it's a 1200rpm fan, but it might be a 1000rpm fan. Nothing faster than that though. Same as the rear, the inside of the front really doesn't present anything we couldn't see from the outside earlier, but there's a good amount of cable management holes towards the top and centre for the I.O. and fan cables. The base at the front of the case houses a rivet fixed drive cage, but it's a bit of an odd one. You can fit a 2.5 inch drive to the top and around the back you can gain access to the single drive sled which can take a 3.5 inch or 2.5 inch drive, which seems a little strange to me. Just one drive. But if you increase the height of the cage to take another drive, it might make the space for two front 120mm fans a little too tight, and you can't fit a 25mm thick fan between the drive cage and the front. So if you try to fix that problem by moving the drive cage towards the back, then there'll be no way you'll be able to fit a 150mm ATX power supply unit to the rear. I think a lot more could have been done with that drive cage area by increasing the length of the case by 8 to 10 millimeters to at least fit another 3.5 inch drive side in and the fans and the 150 millimeter power supply unit. Moving on, the motherboard tray has a fair amount to offer. The front has the majority of the standoffs pre-installed for a micro ATX case, but it's the rear that holds all of the useful features. Down the left side is an array of 12 cable management loops and a decent amount of cable management holes, but I think it's always worth measuring the cable management depth behind the motherboard tray for my reviews from now on since I've come across some really great 20 plus millimeter depths and some really bad 7 millimeter depths. The PS15 however sits at a fairly decent 15 millimeters and we'll see how that works later. Across the top we find some more cable management holes for the fan and CPU power cables, and a loop between the two. And finally to the lower right we see two 2.5 inch drive positions which since we've got 15mm of depth, you could think you could fit a 14mm thick drive, right? Well, not quite since that doesn't leave a lot of room to breathe and it wouldn't fit anyway since the screw and grommet fixing takes up a couple of those millimetres. So I think we've covered the overview, please let me know if I've missed anything you wanted to know, and now we can start installing some hardware. Along with the case, Silverstone sent me a really handy 750 watt, 140mm long, 80 plus gold, fully modular Strider Gold S series power supply unit. This power supply unit hits so many of the spots for a micro ATX build, but I'm not going to be using it for this review. 
This case claims it can take a 150mm power supply unit, therefore I can't properly review this case with a 140mm power supply unit, so I have to use the 150mm EVGA 750G3 that I bought from a subscriber of the channel, Ben Cross. It's only 10mm longer than the Strider S series gold silverstone scent, but every little helps or potentially hinders in this case. I hope Silverstone understands why I'm not using their power supply unit in this review, but I'll definitely be putting the power supply unit to work in many small form factor reviews to come. The installation for the 150mm long 750G3 was relatively smooth, but unfortunately I needed to throw in two 3 connector SATA power cables for the upcoming 4 drives and I needed just one 4 pin Molex connector, so naturally I had to throw in a 3 connector cable for that too. I could do with getting a SATA to Molex adapter for situations like this. You can see here there's not a huge amount of space for the cables to fit between the rear of the power supply unit and the drive cage, but they do stay out of the way of the top 2.5 inch drive position. With this in mind you'd need an extra 10mm on top of the 8-10mm to chassis length extension required for the fans earlier to make a 2-3.5 inch drive sled cage work well with a 150mm power supply unit. Now for the main part of the system, the motherboard CPU and CPU cooler. This doesn't require a lot of explanation, but the fit was very easy since we're working with a very open chassis void of a basement or shroud. The test system consists of an i7-6700K at 4GHz and 1.2V, and we'll be throwing 24GB of 2400MHz DDR4 RAM and an EVGA GTX 1070 for the win at 2000MHz. I've opted to use the Scythe Mugen 5 CPU cooler, which is actually a whole half a millimetre taller than the 154mm cooler clearance of the case. I know, I know, I, I shouldn't be this reckless. Anything could go wrong when the window gets replaced, the pins on the socket could get crushed, the heat pipes could bend out of shape, the inside face of the glass could get scratched, uh, but it turns out the tips of the heat pipes are clear of the chassis so we can move on. As for the drives, this case loves 2.5 inch drives, as do I, so I'm installing a full complement of 2.5 inch drives. First up we have a 4TB 14mm thick 2.5 inch hard disk drive, but the sled says SSD. This isn't an SSD so it can't go there, but it's not big enough for the hard disk drive screw holes. It's a small hard disk drive the size of an SSD, but I'm starting to feel it doesn't belong here. Now I'm really splitting hairs of course, but anyone who's into this stuff knows exactly what to do here, but it seems odd to use technology terminology when we're talking about a form factor and there's a certain amount of interchangeability that's possible. Anyway, using the included screws to fix the drive to the sled, the assembly can then be slotted back into the drive cage, and we can pause here to reflect on how I missed the rail on the left, I did that earlier too. As for the 7mm 2.5 inch drives, they can all be flipped over and the screws and grommets can be applied to all of them. You might have noticed I'm missing one on the Kingston SSD because I completely mashed the thread up on one of the screw holes a while back, but the rest of the drives are fully covered. These can all then be taken away and installed into the three 2.5 inch drive positions seen earlier. Two go to the rear of the motherboard tray, so I'm placing the Samsung boot SSD and Seagate 2.5 inch mass storage drive here, and round the front I'm placing the Kingston SSD which I use as a scratch disk for editing. I went for the Kingston drive up front since I think it better matched the texture of the PS15 steel finish, and the red sticker should suit the upcoming RAM sticks nicely. So drives dealt with, now onto the graphics card. This panel right here is something I've been asking for for a while now. It's your typical slot screw cover kind of affair, but it's got a long slot for the thumb screw to travel back and forth with, so the panel doesn't need removing to install any PCI Express cards. I made the mistake of removing the panel before I installed the graphics card. You don't need to do this. You can install the graphics card perfectly well without removing this panel. I actually had to go back and reinstall the graphics card to get the panel to go back in place after the first installation because I'm a bit crap. So with the graphics card in position and secure, it's time for the round to be set in place. This could have been done earlier, but I'm running two half systems and I needed it before. Anyway, now we can focus on the front panel. This is the part I always underestimate. When I initially think about the front panel, I think, well, you just snap it back on, but oh no. There's a whole host of cables and wires that need cable managing in with the mass of cables already running through the case. Along with all the cables and wires running up to the front IO, and yes, it's a brown PCB, but you don't see it anyway, so it's not that big of a deal, but there's also a lower Molex 2-pin connector that provides power to the logo at the base of the front panel. 
Replacing this thing can be quite time consuming and I'd recommend installing the graphics card after the front panel just to make life easier when you're installing the front IO connectors. But once it's all in place there's actually a surprising amount of space to cable manage the whole system behind the motherboard tray. I've been using my own velcro straps to cable manage here since I can't stand throwing away zip ties after every build and velcro straps allow you to go back and tweak your cable management after without wasting zip ties. When returning the steel side panel back to the case, I was very skeptical that the bulges of cables wouldn't cause a lot of resistance, but I was pleasantly surprised when it went back in place first time without much fuss. It appears that 15 millimeters of depth behind the motherboard tray is just enough to make for a simple cable management process. Now the tempered glass side panel can be replaced as well. I removed the inner film first, but I removed the outer film when the panel was in position without the screws holding the panel in. The film is being pulled off and the panel is being held in place just by those tapered grommets seen earlier. Clearly their grommet design is working well for them and I hope Silverstone continue with this design for many case revisions to come. So there we have it, a complete build in the Silverstone Precision PS15. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time. Oh, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, testing. Uh, I tested the Precision PS15 with the stock single fan to see what it had to offer by itself. And as per my testing methodology, all fans are set to 100%, including the fans on the CPU cooler and graphics card, since this removes any fan curve variables. I then tested the case in a series of different setups to find which worked best with the case. Whenever I go through this kind of experimental testing, I only use Prom95 and Furmark to torture test the system for 10 minutes and see which variation performs best. The fans I've been using for this testing are the ekf 4120 er rpm fans, and just before we get into the results of the experimental testing and then into the full suite of testing, I wanted to cover something quite important about this case with regards to fan installation. Okay, I just want to spend a couple of minutes going over some fan installation tips and just something I really think is important for you to uh, potentially avoid breaking a fan uh, or a fan blade. Uh, so if you're not interested, you're not interested in fans, little quick tips, then please uh, continue with the video, skip to the timestamps below. Uh, but anyway, moving on with exactly what I'm on about here. So I was just setting up for another round of testing, intake uh, in the front and an exhaust in the rear. Uh, I will be doing different variants, which you'll see later. But uh, the point is, because I've sw switched this fan over from exhaust to intake, the fan's blade is in obviously a different um, orientation now. So now instead of the fan's blade being pushed away when it spins up because the orientation of the blade and the direction of the motor, it is now going to rise uh, as the motor spins up, which means as it rises, it will be interacting and I'll show you this in a second, it will interact with the lower levels of metal here that have got cuts into them, which doesn't help here, but either way, if it was flush and there were no cuts in there, it would make zero difference. It's the fact that it's lower down that is causing the problem. Um, so this, when I spin it up, it's gonna uh, allow the, the fan's blades to rise, uh, rise and meet the metal here. I'll give you an example of that now. If I do too many more takes of this, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna lose a fan blade. And while we're on that note, uh, if you think that's far fetched, that is one of my previous fans. Uh, sorry if it's slightly out of focus, but there we go. The fan blade has just been snapped off, uh, and that was because it caught on a flush piece of metal uh, to the front of a case. Now I wouldn't expect people to use intakes in this position here. Uh, I've done testing on it previously and I find it silly. I just want to do it again just to represent again to people that it is silly. Um, but the front intakes that you have, if you have flush metal like this case has all the way down its front, you're going to want to have some washers involved. And that's hence why I've put washers in preemptively because I knew this would be the case. Um, so yeah, you could say it's a fault with the fan, uh, but frankly, it should be expected. It's a dynamic component and there are more tolerances in a dynamic component than there are, or more variants in the tolerance in a dynamic component than there is in a static component. So uh, just want to say, add in some washers and you'll be all good. And it would actually be nice to see case manufacturers include some washers for instances like this, uh, rather than having to go and buy some out in the store. Um, but there we go. That's my piece on that. Hope it uh, helped anybody and we move on with the rest of the review.
Okay, I wasn't expecting to do a follow-up, but I thought I may as well show what's fixed the problem for me. Underneath each of these screws, which I applied by unscrewing two sides, then just lowering one side and slipping in these rubber washers here, which is probably easier to show if I show it on my hand. Uh, the rubber washer I've got is 1.4 millimeters thick, uh, so just about 1.4 millimeters thick, uh, and it's lightly screwed in place, which is all it needs to hold them. These aren't gonna unscrew themselves, and even if they did, with this case, it's frankly just a simple case of lifting this off and then you know, tighten up a bit, but anyway, so they shouldn't come loose anyway, and the result is... So clearly the scratching is gone, the 1.4 millimeters is just enough to make it work. Uh, in reality, with the slight squish that there is in these, it'll be about one millimeter. Uh, but this is running at full speed now, because my fan curves are set to run at full speed, uh, and I'll get on with testing. I need to apply all the panels next, but, uh, but anyway, cheers guys. So the results for the experimental testing. Sorry if the text is super small, I'll explain and highlight the key results as we go along so nobody's left in the dark. A quick breakdown of the suffix to the naming of each testing run. T stands for top, F stands for front, R stands for rear, IN stands for intake and X stands for exhaust. So if we take the fourth result down, we have the Silverstone Precision PS15 with two front intakes, two top fans, the top front being an intake and the top rear being an exhaust, and a single rear exhaust fan. I'm yet to implement this naming convention across all of the cases in the list yet, but I think it's the best for information density and clarity and something I'd look to do in the future. So let's analyze the results. The worst performer was the stock setup with the single rear stock fan, which came in with a GPU result shown in green of 45.8 degrees Celsius Delta T, Delta T being the raw result minus the ambient temperature of the room to normalize the results for comparative purposes. The stock setup also saw the CPU shown in blue rise to 39.8 0.8 degrees Celsius Delta T. This is not a bad result when comparing it with the other results with far more fans. The results just above it, for instance, had two 2200 RPM front intakes and a 2200 RPM rear exhaust, and only turned out to be 4 degrees C better on both the CPU and GPU. I found it really interesting that the two front intakes, top front intake and top rear exhaust and rear exhaust was considerably better on GPU thermals than the variation with two top intakes. So perhaps two top intakes wasn't as silly as I made it out to be earlier. But all of the previous was beaten by the single top rear exhaust with two front intakes and rear exhaust fan. Notice how you get a better result, at least in this case, with a single top rear exhaust over two top intakes. That's a decent money saver right there. But trumping all of that, if we can still use that term, was the two front intakes, two top exhausts, and single rear exhaust variant. Now this only improved on the previous variant in GPU thermals, but it was the best overall as well. Now it's worth noting that under full load and full fan speed, there was only a 6 degree CPU and 8 degree GPU difference between the stock and the best performing variation with 4 extra fans. Thinking price wise, you're looking at about between 30 and 50 pounds worth of fans to see that in improvement. You might be able to get a better price performance with other fans. From my point of view, it's not worth it since the stock system was at a true temperature of about 60 degrees Celsius. And that's not that hot for a consumer PC component. Now we're going to run through the full suite of thermal testing results with the stock and best performing variation. First up is Firestrike with graphics test 1. You'll notice there are a few more cases thrown into these graphs. We have a few test bench results with various sized CPU coolers with the same testing system, I may add. We also have the large Level 20 VT Micro ATX case, Metallic Gear Neo G Mini Mini ITX case, which was very similarly sized to the PS15, and the very slim Silverstone RVZ03 Mini ITX case to give us a good variation of case sizes for the comparison, and because I haven't tested all that many cases since the change in testing methodology. Ordered by GPU temperature, since this is a graphics test, there's not a lot of variance in GPU temperatures. There's loads of variance in CPU temperatures, however, since there's nearly no load on the CPU and it's a basically a who's got the best ambient temperature competition. So we're going to skip to the physics test results and see how the CPU cooling fares in the Precision PS15. Ordered by CPU temperature, the PS15 seems to be very strong in the CPU cooling department, and depending on the setup, it's as good as the two times larger Thermaltake Level 20 VT and 
and far better than the similarly sized Neo G Mini. This performance is maintained in the combined test result. You'll probably notice that there are a few results that have identical CPU and GPU temperatures, and it looks suspicious. But I promise that was what actually happened. I didn't accidentally copy or paste anything, or just write down the same results. They just happened to be the same Delta T value. Unigen Heaven shows the PS15 to again not be the coolest when it comes to the graphics card, and the same can be gathered from the superposition result. The Metallic Gear Neo G Mini seems to do far better in both. Rise of the Tomb Raider is ordered by CPU temperature, and the PS15 seems to be pretty competent, but if you focus on the GPU temperature, it's not doing as well as the optimal RVZ03 or Neo G Mini results. It's not like the PS15 is as much as 10 degrees Celsius worse, but it's just not quite as good. Hitman sees the PS15 perform well with regards to CPU temperature and average in the GPU temperature department, at least between this list of cases, and more of the same can be found from the GTA 5 benchmark. And finally, the comparison of the Prime 95 and Fermark results. In terms of CPU thermal performance, the PS15, as in many of the previous benchmarks, comes out looking very impressive, right at the top of the list actually beating the level 20 VT, which seems surprising, but isn't so much when you consider the PS15 had two high-speed fans directing air through a more concentrated area, and the level 20 VT had a 200mm fan directing air through a far larger area. But if we order by GPU temperature, the PS15 and Level 20 VT don't do as well as the Metallic Gear Neo G Mini. The PS15 and Level 20 VT aren't all that much hotter, but they're just under 4 degrees Celsius hotter than the best in this list. So that is the majority of the review out of the way, but I feel the most important part in terms of getting a good summary of what this case is like is this section now. It's the pros, cons, and missed opportunities, if you can see it. Ah, everything's out of exposure. Uh, before we get onto that, though, uh, I hope you enjoyed, maybe for those of you who've seen more than one of my videos, uh, the different sort of panning style that I was going with. Uh, I used this, which is some sort of like Z frame thing, to mount it onto my uh, camera head, uh, and then I had my camera at an offset back from the normal point of rotation so you'd see the background move more move different at a different pace of the foreground which gave it a bit more of a sort of I don't know converging maybe style of, of uh, recording so if you like that then let me know and I'll, and I'll do that it's a little bit more difficult because there's a lot of offset from the main pivot point uh, so the leverage or um, the extra leverage of the way the camera's weight sort of stops panning from being so simple but if you like it I'll, I'll try and do it more often or at least you know in b-roll stuff but it was happening throughout the video so anyway uh, so pros cons missed opportunities we'll start with the pros then we'll go over the cons and we'll end on the missed opportunities so pros thermals stock was pretty solid stock thermals there was actually the the cases that we were comparing to uh, minus that of the stock Mini ITX Neo G Mini uh, were really solid. You saw that the upgraded Neo G Mini, which had four intakes and one exhaust, uh, which was the best configuration I found to be, uh, was 
was pretty decent, really decent in terms of graphics, uh, card thermals, stuff like that, but this did really well all round. Uh, no surprise, since most of the front is used for intake, of course there's the bezel and then there's the frame for support, uh, which is stopping some of the ventilation, plus you've got a filter and you've got the um, the mesh over the top as well. So there is quite a bit of resistance up front. Just because you see a lot of holes doesn't mean it's good ventilation, but this seems to be pretty decent. Uh, so I say that's a pro. The tempered glass, definitely something that I feel is a pro in, in a better price case or better, more budget price case. Um, I always look for tempered glass and I always recommend tempered glass whenever anybody asks me for a recommendation because... I can't stand plastic, it just scratches way too easily. I actually dropped a fork from plate which hit the carpet at a weird angle and then bashed into the side of this. Not a scratch on it at all. Uh, you would expect to see some damage on plastic. Um, and uh, along with the tempered glass, actually one of the bottom um, pros I have, but I'll mention it now, is the retention mechanism. I know it's a minor point and I have sort of ridiculed it on some cases, but when you take those screws off and it stays there, it's just appreciated. It's nice. Instead of having it fall off, which I've had in other cases, uh, especially near this price range as well. The tempered glass upgrade from some cases, one in particular, which I won't mention, but a lot of you have seen some of my reviews in the past. Um, actually, I'll mention it anyway. The Q300L, um, that I just didn't appreciate the retention mechanism, which basically wasn't there. And when you, for an extra 10 quid, you can upgrade to tempered glass and have a better retention mechanism. Seems good to me. Uh, so anyway, uh, moving on, overall build quality I felt was pretty good. Some minor comments in, in, in the cons segment for that. Uh, cable management though, spot on. Um, there's just and just enough space. I uh, would, would have liked another five millimeters. I'll never say no to more uh, cable management space, but the cable management loop amount was fantastic. I would definitely recommend getting some thin Velcro straps, not straps themselves, but if you get a reel of thin Velcro, that works better. You can cut it to your, uh, so your, your heart's content into different um, pieces and then you know do it that way. But yeah, uh, the amount of holes available around uh, to get through to the mother of the motherboard tray was perfect, uh, and the amount of cable management loops was just loads more than average. Um, so that's a really good pro on that one. Uh, two and a half inch drive mounting uh, positions, I really like that. Two and a half inch drives, as you can see, I've got quite a lot of them, and I run all of my systems on just two and a half inch drives. Uh, that will be changing in the future, and we'll get onto that at some point in the future. Uh, I like the PCI Express screw cover panel. It's it's not a big thing, but I liked it. Uh, and then the last one was the tempered glass screw retention mechanism. So moving on to cons, um, PCI Express slot covers. Don't like punch out covers. They have one that you can replace, which is fair enough because if you put a two slot card in there and you take it out and replace it for a single slot card, you can replace the one. And they're not that expensive. You can get them yourself, but it's not that expensive to include, when, especially when they're mass produced and shipped with the product and not shipped individually when you have to buy them yourself. It wouldn't cost all that much to add a few more in, at least in the accessories bag, if you don't want to have to um, sort of manual labor punch them out, as it were. But I suppose the machine would just cut straight through, so it wouldn't matter. Uh, but anyway. Rear I.O. ridge. There is a ridge to the rear I.O. of the mother on the motherboard, and that is annoying to me. I really didn't like it. And for that matter, I actually found that there was the metal was um, more pronounced. Uh, the steels, the slats were more pronounced uh, between the GPU, which meant that trying to plug in some connectors, such as the uh, DVI connector I use, uh, was just a no, display port connector, sorry, I just found was a pain. So, yeah, you know, your, your mileage may vary on that. It was usable, but not, not as good as I'd like it to be. Um, and yeah, the front I.O. cables, though. Now, something I didn't mention during the view is because it happened afterwards, I feel this is a be the best place to place it, uh, is that there was one of the cables actually broke. The wires of the uh, audio cables at the front broke off when I pulled this off during some B-roll segment, uh, and that's just a huge pain in the butt. Um, I'm going to have to either solder that on or just sheath it and then reconnect it somehow, um, or strip it and then reconnect it somehow. Uh, but that's a pain in the butt because that will stop the front I.O. Um, uh, audio jacks working, which is obviously a pain. Uh, that's just, I would prefer, which we'll go on to the missed opportunity segment actually, I'll, I'll, I'll just get on with the cons for now. Um, minor build tolerance issues, the top panel there were some issues, and there's minor issues around here, just tolerance, so that can be tightened up, maybe that's more of a missed opportunity thing for a future build, but it's a budget case, it varies from person to person, so it's up to you really. Uh, and then the flat front panel, and, and mildly flat top flat top panel. I find it a little strange actually, that, that the majority of fans uh, have, a, have the airflow through the front end and exit 
the, the place where the spokes are, so the fan is more likely to hover away from the spokes and become exposed. Sorry, there's a fly flying around. Um, it's more likely to hover away and get um, away from those spokes and be and get them towards the exposed part, which would clatter with anything that it moves into. Now, not with every fans this is the case. Now, the fans I've actually been using were the Silverstone uh, ones that Silverstone sent me. You can check that out in the top right-hand corner for that video, which um, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but yeah, those have a better tolerance on them. The Vardas I'm using actually don't have much of a tolerance at all. And every fan I've come across where there's been a flat ridge, a flat panel with cut and cutouts and grooves available to sort of nick onto, it will scratch and scrape. So I would prefer for it to be bulged out. Now I find it weird, back to that point, the rear ones are always set with a bulge out and even the top ones, you're generally going to use the top, um, the top panel for exhaust. It's set with a bulge to avoid that situation. But you're not going to get into that situation because on the whole, the spokes are generally on the exhaust side, not the intake side. So, yeah, anyway, your mileage may vary with different fans. So, on to missed opportunities. I think the power supply unit filter, which I mentioned earlier on, uh, it's flimsy. It's a little bit, you know, it's... It's very cheap. It would have been nice to have another one like the top panel here. It would have been nice to have one like this, the magnetic strips on the sides, just a small square one. Uh, maybe something for a future revision. You may have noticed there was a bulge on here. It's because I've actually lashed the uh, LED control panel for this to the top, which, you know, it doesn't look so good if you look close, uh, but it's okay. I actually did find it difficult to add in extra accessories, such as a uh, 1 to 8 Silverstone adapter I've had way back. Um, I tried to uh, add that in to control all the fans. Instead, I just bailed on that and went for a one to three splitter cable and, and spread that across the CPU uh, fan header and the system fan two header. Um, although the system fan two header is not true PWM, it does a DC kind of PWM, so yeah, which isn't PWM at all, if you know what PWM is. Uh, but anyway, um, so um, the lack of a manual. I would have liked to have a manual just to point some basic things out, even just a sheet of paper, that would have been nice, wouldn't have cost a lot to add in. I'd like to see that. Even on a budget case, £50 isn't that budget, so you can add a manual in. Single 3.5 inch drive, for the reasons I mentioned earlier, uh, you could add a touch more, maybe... Uh, 20 mil isn't just isn't a touch. It will add extra expense onto everything else, such as the size of the tempered glass and that sort of stuff. But it wouldn't add that much more on. You could add an extra five pounds on top of it, which obviously would start bringing it into the range of some other um, sort of more expensive cases. But if there's any potential to increase the length a little bit, to add in that space for fans to slot down past the uh, um, past the three and a half inch drive cage, and add in another level of a hard disk drive sled for a three and a half inch drive, you could fit two three and a half inch drives in there. You could fit a two and a half inch drive on top. You'd have enough space for the power supply unit for some cable management. Uh, although maybe a little bit more would be on top of that. But then again, you get into a much bigger case and more expensive. Uh, but at least then you could fit two three and a half inch drives, which would be more accessible to more people who are thinking of upgradability and aren't into two and a half inch drives. It's a personal preference. Uh, but anyway, 150 millimeter power supply unit, again, sort of on size things, kind of missing the boat on the very common 160 millimeter power supply unit. Uh, again, I could have used the 140 that was sent to me by Silverstone, but this channel tests thing, uh, test cases more to what they recommend they can take, not, uh, so if I get an ATX, or if I get a uh, micro ATX power um, case, I'm not gonna st stick in a mini ITX um, motherboard because I can already foresee some problems with a micro ATX motherboard. I stick in the, the largest components it says that it can fit in. And when it comes to drives, I at least try to occupy the slots to show you guys what they're like. But anyway, 150 mil power supply unit, just missing the very common 160 millimeter. In my opinion, maybe a future revision or they have other cases and there are loads of cases around that cover that anyway so yeah, again personal preference and the uh, the io is attached to the front again the point i made it would have been nice to uh made earlier it would have been nice to attach the front io to the top of the chassis and not the front panel because the front panel is a dynamic component you want the io to be static unless it's going to be able to move around in an interesting way like the thermal take level 20 vt and the basically it's it's um sort of cheaper cousin or cheaper brother um, uh, the Core V21, that can move around, that's fair enough, but this doesn't, it should really be uh, con connected to a static object, but then again the connection might not be so clean uh, as, it, as a plastic mould. So. Closing the book on that. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you like the. F this is the first 
uh, ever video that I've had a, a company send me something for free. So a huge thank you to Silverstone for doing that and having the confidence, of course. Uh, I'm not representing the company. I, I did use that word before, but I'm not representing the company. I'm purely doing a review of my own and they're sending me something, And but they want to see uh, a review done by me uh, because they, they like what they see. And for such a small uh, subscriber base uh, and not that many views, really, well, I was getting more before, but I've sort of tipped off the scales a little bit. Uh, actually, I don't think that's true. I think it's been okay. I think it's been relatively level while I've been working on all sorts of stuff in the background. So anyway, thank you so much for checking this one out. I'm looking to do a review on something I can't talk about now. Uh, I'm looking to do a review on the AIO they sent me, the TDO2 RGB, which is a 240mm RGB uh, fanned um, AIO, which will be the first AIO review I've ever done, and I'm going to look to compare that against radiators in a custom loop uh, and see price performance wise. Obviously, the AIO is going to win, but it'd be nice to see performance wise how comparable they are. And I've got all sorts of stuff coming in the future, such as the DIY project, which is behind me, and I just need to do some more work on that. Uh, quite a bit more work on that. Um, but anyway, cheers, guys. I will catch you in one of those videos, if not some other one in the far flung future. Uh, eh, that's the term. Uh, but anyway, see you guys. Bye bye. Oh, yeah, uh, Patreon and stuff and videos. Yeah, see you guys.